Attachment isn't just emotional connection. It is the way that human beings survive. God created us to be connected in this in this attached way where our needs are met and and we are we have this like primal connection to uh, our caretakers. Welcome to the show where we talk about topics in modern Christianity that are so challenging, they require us to be grounded in something much bigger than ourselves. If you're here, you have likely found yourself hungry for something deeper. You want to find answers for how to hold on to your faith after seeing religion be twisted in a way that has somehow become bad news instead of good. I'm here for all of that too. I'm here for the spiritual wrestle, and I'm here to learn more ways that people are finding hope in a God that interrupts our norms and expectations. I can't thank my team at Kindred Exchange enough for being willing to bring podcasts like this to the world of global missions. We are committed to fostering conversations and facilitating cross-cultural exchanges that empower the global church to serve together. At Kindred Exchange, we believe that missions is and should be considered mutual, where the church in North America is carrying out the mission of God with the same invitation as the church in Zimbabwe, Peru, Myanmar, and Iraq. We are all offering a unique flavor of hospitality to the world, and we are made whole by one another's walk with our Creator. Within our organization, you'll find followers of Christ who love missions enough to see it done differently. And we welcome you into our exploration of the reformation and redemption of the North American mission system. Check us out at kindredexchange.org. Well, as we have been talking about an entire host of issues around the concept of orphan care, around vulnerable children, um, we have really been hanging out in the international space a lot. Um, And we're going to move into conversations on the domestic side here within the US as it relates to uh, to vulnerable children here in our own backyard. And I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to today than Jamie Finn. Jamie, I'm so um, thankful that you took the time to be with us today and talk about your experience in, in the foster care system uh, here in the United States. And I mean, you've got 10 years of experience um, as a foster mom and you've grown your family uh, through through adoption, through the fostering system as well. So um, thank you for taking some time to share your wealth of knowledge with us today. Oh, I'm so happy to. And I'm honored, Lauren, because you um, really have encouraged and taught me. Uh, and so to just sit and, and chat with you really is an honor. I'm grateful. Well, you know, there are a lot of things that we step into because we feel maybe a burden on our heart, or we feel that we're equipped to step into a space of darkness or a a space of brokenness in the world. And I really do see those as invitations, you know, not as commands from, from the Lord, but within that invitation is a whole host of surprises that we didn't know, things that we learn about ourselves, things that we learn about systems, things that we learn about humanity that um, can unnerve us a little bit. I'm wondering, you know, when you started uh, diving into the care of kids that were in the fostering system, what did you expect would come out of that? And maybe what are some things that, I know this is a huge question to start with, but what are some things that you've kind of discovered to be the norms that maybe you didn't know existed before? Yeah. Well, I would say nearly all of my expectations were uh, incorrect, limited, um, and driven by ignorance, which is, um, of course, we're ignorant about things we don't know, but also arrogance. Um, And that is where there is just more of this. uh, When I share about the expectations, it comes with a sense of humility and repentance of, of even the approach that I came in with. And so I was just so certain that the kids that I would be caring for were in kind of stuck in these relationships with family members who didn't love them, were bad people. And it was my responsibility to come and rescue them from them so that they could have a chance to finally be loved and I could heal them. 
and prayerfully they would get to stay with me forever and they would never have to go back. And that Mm -hmm. was very much the, the heart that I came in with and a heart that was so fueled by love and a desire to honor God and to follow him into this. And then still was touched by such ignorance and arrogance. So when I came in with that approach of, of essentially my love is going to heal these kids, all they need is love. All they need is to come in and finally experience what I have to offer. And that will be so healing. So besides the lessons I've learned about the kinds of parents that I thought these kids had and who they actually are, um, besides the, the things that I've learned about, um, approaching with humility, approaching with, um, coming alongside rather than sort of, I'm in the helper and you are the one who needs me sort of perspective. I have learned a lot about, um, how limited our love is really how much we can love our kids, um, and how healing love can be and still how limited it can be to, to bring about healing, um, for kids who their brains and bodies and beliefs have been so touched by what they've experienced or not experienced. So, yeah, that, that first picture that you painted of, I'm going to, I'm going to love kids who are hopeless and then have nothing, you know, and who have nothing in, in their social network to support them. And, you know, that's a, that's a vision that we can put a bow on and, Uh, it seems really, it seems really clean and easy. And I guess yeah. everyone uh, would, would be able to step into this type of work. If, if it was that simple, um, I, sh- I shared this on a podcast with Angela Tucker. I had her on recently right. and um, you know, she's, I know, you know her, she's fantastic. And, and I was telling her about how my own therapist had said, you can't love the trauma out of someone and how that really, you know, stopped me in my tracks. And she said, not only can you not love the trauma out of someone, but a lot of times as the adoptive or the foster mom, you are complicit in the pain. Mm. Mm. That really, that really stopped me in my tracks, <laughs> but I know exactly what she's saying, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, what, how would you respond um, because I'm, I'm assuming that people would hear that and, and feel guarded or mm-hmm. want to get defensive mm-hmm. when you hear that, what comes, what comes to your mind, um, that type of reality. So none of us got into this because we wanted to be complicit in trauma. None of us were, were holding a desire that we had above the good of a child intentionally, but the reality is that our kids have entered our care wounded by the experience of us becoming their parents. So especially when we're talking about foster care, it is not just that they had trauma, that there was neglect and there was abuse. Potentially the most traumatic and probably the most painful experience is actually being removed from that abuse and neglect. Mm-hmm. And So then our kids come to us and there is first the reality that we are a part of it. It's also when we start talking about attachment that our kids don't know how to separate the the pain of the loss with the gain of the family, with the gain of us. And so we are a part of that in their story, in their narrative of the loss and the wound there. And that's an important thing for us to remember as we're seeking attachment and connection with a child that there is not only potentially, well, always a disrupted attachment, but potentially an insecure attachment style that we are also there's going to be a a block there for them potentially of, of the wound that we were a part of in them leaving their family and joining ours. Um, I love how you put that because I think it, it lays and really why I wanted you to bring you on is to talk about just normalizing that attachment process. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not a, I, I love you. I feed you. I house you. There's not this like, uh, 
feeling of reciprocity that is that is healthy in in an in an attachment style that has been disrupted in the past. And also none of us, you know, there's an ongoing, we're always attaching to people that we are assessing. Are, are you safe? Are you safe for me? Will you continue to be safe if I am my truest self? Um, you know, that's a, that's a natural way that our brains work. So thinking about how uh, kids are experiencing a traumatic experience, even leaving an abusive or neglectful environment is something that I think is new learning for a lot of us to, to start to normalize that, um, that, that wound of leaving a place that, uh, while it might not have been meeting my physical, emotional needs, um, it was still home. Right. So how have you found, how have you found that the kids in your care and in your, in, in the home that you've created, um, how do they perceive home and how do they define, how do they define home and how do you how do you define home with them? Yeah, it, I think a big part of this is what their story was, um, before they joined our family. And so the, the foundational thing, I think for all of the kids, even if they join our home day one and don't know what they're losing and the love that they were the recipients of all of our kids have have right away, just this, this foundation of being a part of something that being who they are, them being put biologically, um, connected to a family and loved by that family. So that is, is right away something that that is what we say, like home is where the heart is home is where the people who love you. So, so that is a foundation for so many of our kids home is mom home is your attachment figures that is how we we define home not as a house and so we can see it as like look at this beautiful home i'm offering you look at the safety and security i'm offering you isn't this such a happy day that you get to come and finally be safe and finally have what you need um but home really is representative of attachment it is our, our connection, which attachment isn't just emotional connection. It is the way that human beings survive. God created us to be connected in this, in this attached way where our needs are met. And, and we are, we have this like primal connection to uh, our caretakers. And so that is, that is a piece sort of just like big picture foundationally. But then I would say, you know, I think of, of a teenager that I, I cared for who loved our home, loved our family, had so many happy and fun memories. And we would have conversations where she would talk about sleeping on the floor of a hotel. And I would say, do you wish that you were there instead? And she would say, absolutely. Absolutely. So it didn't matter that she had a beautiful room where she went and picked out that her bedding and she got to have this happy family with these memories. And for her home was the floor of a hotel room because that is where she was with the people who, who were hers, who she belonged to and loved. Um, and so it is not as simple as we would define it as we define um, things, as we define connections, uh, it's really complex for our kids to love and feel safe in our homes and families and also have that primal craving for what home and family really is. Absolutely. And, and so many times they don't feel safe or feel like they can tell us that right? Like that there's going back to Angela's story in her book, you know, you should be grateful just saying, you know, I know that I should feel something different about being here and having this, this house or these things or these people who love me, but I don't know that I can tell them that this is not, um, this is not where I, I wish that I didn't have to be here. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, um, you, you shared on your blog on foster the family blog, some things that go through your mind as you are sitting with a child who is experiencing uh, some dysregulation. Sometimes, you know, these are called trauma meltdowns. Sometimes they are, um, I don't know, there's, there's other, there's ways to define it. Some that I feel like are, are harmful to the child and are not a true presentation of what's going on inside. 
unless you have been in the room with a child who feels threatened by safety. I don't yeah. know that you can really understand what's going on um, when we even use uh, those words around the meltdown. Mm -hmm. But if someone is listening to this podcast and they have a kiddo that they're loving, <clears throat> that has been aggressive or has been incredibly resistant um, to that safety, you shared some really powerful tools of what kind of goes through your mind and how you rationalize and, and practice embodiment in those moments. Um, can you talk through kind of maybe what goes on physiologically for you in those moments and how you've found a way to be a safe and steady, um, co-regulating body in the room? Mm. So the first thing when, when I see that my, my kiddo is super dysregulated, really struggling, uh, and you said not feeling safe, the, I think instinct that we have, um, as human, as parents who love our kids, um, and for most of us who, who step into this space, who have dismissive parenting styles, that is going to be our, our attachment style is going to be dismissive, meaning like, let's fix this and move on. Um, it's going to be harder for us to sit in, in our kids pain with them. My, my tendency would be, how do I fix this? What is the key, the quick fix to get you out of this and to move on? Um, and so that involves talking. It involves touching. It involves moving. It involves directions. And those are all of the last things that my kids mm -hmm. And so the big thing for me is working to keep myself calm so that I am available and ready for them when they are able to receive that calm. So the idea of co-regulation is that our kids uh, don't have the ability to self-regulate. And this goes back to uh, childhood development and, and, the fact that like infants have no ability to self-regulate, they're dependent on us for everything. That some of our kids, because of the lack of felt safety, because their their bodies and the environment don't always feel safe to them, um, they are dependent on us to help them come to a place of regulation, which when we're saying it in this way, we usually mean come to a place of calm. Regulation means that your nervous system is matching whatever the environment is. But when we say dysregulated, 90% of the time, what we're saying is our kids have no ability to calm themselves. And so my number one battle as a parent is to calm myself, to keep myself calm. And so this looks like sometimes um, sitting right with them and breathing deep breaths and keeping myself calm. It looks like telling myself over and over, I could do this for as long as this kid needs me to, because the mantra that comes to me naturally is I can't do this. We need to move on. I don't have time for this. So I say, I can sit with her as long as she needs me. I am praying. And sometimes my prayers can get scared and frenetic. And so a lot of times I'm just praying to God about who God is. I'm literally just saying, God, you are good. God, you are kind. God, you are with me. I'm just thanking him for his character in the middle of this. Again, none of these are anything to do with my child. It's all to do with me keeping myself regulated so that I can then come and share my calm with my child who's so dysregulated. It is 90% me work to be with my kids in their pain, in their fear. Um, if I'm doing my work to be calm and be with them, then I am ready to, to help rescue them from, from the fear and the suffering that they're experiencing. Mm. <laughs> I I have told my kids often when they ask me, mom, is it hard to be a mom? Are you so tired? You know, yada, yada. I hear moms complaining a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I say, you know, you guys are the ones that saved me. You are mm -hmm. the ones who humbled me and got me in touch with so many parts of myself that I didn't even know were a part of who I am. And for those of us who are raised, especially in Christian homes that kind of prompted this A plus B equals C 
reaction in kids. You know, mm -hmm. if we create boundaries and we discipline correctly, you're going to have a straight A student that goes to college and okay. never makes a mistake. Yeah. But, you know, stepping into a trauma home is a very different response of connecting with your kids. I'm, I'm not sure what parenting style you brought into this, you know, into the work of, of fostering and adoption, but how might you, how might you talk to people who have a natural tendency towards, you know, parenting through discipline versus yeah. trauma-informed parenting? Yeah. I, to answer your question, I came in with a very traditional Christian parenting, first time obedience, uh, respect. That was, uh, the way that I was brought up. It was the way I parented for five years before I became a foster parent. And you know what? It worked with my first kiddo who was not neurodivergent as a second kiddo was. Um, and who was like a happy little people pleaser, it worked, but it, it stopped working, which then forced me to consider what I was actually doing all along with trauma informed care. And I love to even, you know, going back to the Christian parenting thing, I love to talk about trauma informed gospel centered parenting. Uh, and that those two things I don't think are in conflict or contradicting contradiction that they can and should be done together. And the idea here is just a tiny bit of understanding of how the brain functions, which to oversimplify it is the brain doesn't function well when it's scared. And so when our kids are lashing out in something, lying to protect something, um, you know, feeling possessive of something that's theirs, the kinds of bad behaviors that we would talk about. Our tendency is to create a rule, to demand that they follow that rule, to enforce it, and then to bring some kind of correction in the the form of pain. One, you know, whether it's taking something or or giving something that that is taking a child, especially when it is a trauma survival behavior, taking a child who is operating, um, from a place of fear, from a place of survival or from a place of such dig dysregulation that they really don't have access to their prefrontal cortex where they do great thinking and planning and remembering. Um, and they, don't have a calm brain. They don't have a calm body. And it's not a great time to try to teach anything. And for some reason, that is when we have most of our lessons with, with our kids in traditional parenting. That is when you teach your children, you teach them right or wrong when they are, when they're elevated, uh, nervous system and their brain isn't integrated and, and everything in their body is not in a great place to receive our training. So what I really believe in is helping my kids brains and bodies come to a place of calm and regulation so that we can access their hearts so that we can access who they are and apply biblical truths, apply gospel comforts. And so there are, you know, every behavior is not a survival behavior. We are in need of the forgiveness of Jesus. We are in need of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so helping my kids um, understand why they were doing what they were doing, what a better way is God's commands to them, God's promises for them, the help that they can receive through God, the, the, comforts of the gospel for when they make mistakes. If I'm bringing them to a place of calm, helping them feel safe so that their integrated brain and safe uh, nervous system can hear and feel what I'm sharing, then I'm actually getting to the heart of the behavior and, and really teaching them instead of just shutting things down, fixing things, uh, and really getting my way as a parent. In Haiti, children who grow up in orphanages and child servitude systems are often forgotten once they age out at 18. 
When released, many youth lack the education, life skills, and emotional maturity to live a functional life of independence. Since 2013, Emmaus House has been standing in the gap for orphaned youth in Haiti. Rooted in Christian family settings, we provide holistic care to help youth 18 and older heal from their pasts, be equipped for today, and find empowerment for tomorrow. This holiday season, we'd love for you to join us. Shop our holiday catalog for gifts that will directly impact the lives of orphan youth in Haiti who are working hard towards a better future. Simply go to EmmausHaiti.org backslash holiday catalog to give your gift today. And to learn more about Emmaus House, check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Emmaus House Haiti. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Think Orphan. Think Orphan is the podcast for orphan excellence. Since 2016, Think Orphan has been facilitating conversations in global child welfare, orphan care, and Christian thought. Hosted by Brandon Stiver and Phil Dark, every other Tuesday they discuss issues of foster care and adoption, child protection, and cross-cultural ministry with leaders from around the world. Subscribe to Think Orphan on Apple, Spotify, or whichever podcast platform you prefer. Okay, we're going to hang out here because there's so (laughs) much that whether you are a foster or adoptive parent, whether you have a blended family, whether you, uh, you know, kind of lean into traditional parenting, there's so much here because it's directly tied to the way that our kids see religion, the way Mm. they see who God is Mm. and, and the ways that we may even be using religion to abuse our kids, not understanding what we're doing, because like you said, we are we are choosing to inject religious truths or um, gospel truths in a time when their brains are not processing that information about who God is in a way that communicates love, safety, mercy. And I have to, you know, I say to my kids all the time, one of, one of my kiddos was upset with me when, when she left the house the other day and I picked her up from school in the afternoon, I'm totally fine. And she will not look me in the eyes. Mm. And she says, mom, I just, I just can't even look at you. I'm so ashamed of how I acted this morning. Mm -hmm. And I said, can I have a hug? (laughs) Like, I don't love you because of how you treat me. I don't love you because of, of, you know, what you do for me, you know, and, and just reiterating those, those truths over and over again. I'm going to tell on myself too, this morning, you know, I, to be totally honest, I was not feeling great this morning. I forgot a few things that had to happen on the way to school. So I'm kind of driving like a maniac on the way to school. And I've got, you know, I've got three kids in the car at this point and I'm handing a a Z bar to the back to feed the one-year-old that didn't get to eat before we left anyways. So I said to, I said to my son, I was like, can you hand it to him just like this? And being a six-year-old, he takes it out of the wrapper and he like hides it behind the the chair just to get a rise out of the one-year-old. And I just like my lid flips and I'm like, what? And as soon as that came out of my mouth, I thought, Hey, you are not, you're not regulated. You are not in control. <laughs> to take a few deep breaths, took some time. And even in that, to be able to, to sit and share with him, this is what's going on in my body. This is what's going on in my brain. And when you did this, what do you think it communicated to me? Even if that was not your intention. And honestly, I mean, he's six, he didn't have words for that. And I said, this is kind of how it made me feel. And that's why I responded the way that I did, but that was not right. And it was not you. So I'm, I'm sorry. This is how I'm practicing, you know, getting myself in check. Um, Do you think next time you could be, you know, rather than me saying, you know, Quinn, why did you do that? So that's not the right way to respond. Do you right, think? right. And he doesn't know I did it. Oh, he has no idea. You know, I said, do you think maybe, you know, we could just approach our family? Like, how can we all help each other be the best that we can be? Yep, yep. And he was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Mom. Yeah. I mean, I, I still feel at this every single day, but I want so badly for my kids to be able to access, you know, who they are in their heart and to be able to see that their behaviors are connected to the way that they the way that they see the world. Sorry, that was a rant. I just, um, no, no, it wasn't. I think it's an an exact, that is how we want to do it. We want to help our kids understand what's happening in their brains and bodies. And then also say, this wasn't right. Will you please forgive me? And so it can be both of those things. You were dysregulated and that is a reality and you shouldn't have done what you did. And so we can still seek repentance and forgiveness. And that's where I think where the truest Christian parenting comes in is when, when it's holistic, when it's mind, body, spirit, soul, when we're connecting all of those things and helping our kids learn how to do that as well. Mm, it, it is all of those things. And 
if we are only teaching a God of vengeance and a God of discipline, mm-hmm. then, and, and I'm not saying that those are not important parts of understanding that our, our actions do have an impact on other people. The things that we do, do, you know, they, they absolutely, you know, we have a responsibility to the way that, the way that those things affect other people. But, um, if we don't feel loved, if we don't feel cherished, if we don't understand that our being created was, was done out of an affection for who we are and a desire for connection, then mm-hmm. I think that we're, we're really missing out on a huge component of what the gospel is. That's right. That's right. And teaching our kids that they have to earn um, their place in our family. They have to earn for things to be okay teaches them that not only they have to earn our love, they have to earn God's love, which is so Mm -hmm. antithetical to the gospel that we're, we're not only like, oh, we're missing parts of it. We could be turning our kids to, to a a legalism, to a law that is not even what Jesus has for them. Right. Right. Um, this is, this is another conversation this week where one of my kids was like, I just wish I could just be by myself. And I didn't have to be around anyone else. The world would be so much easier. And I could just like be alone. And I was like, well, you didn't even have to build your own house. Well, I just, I would just live outside by myself. Oh, okay. Well then, you know, so we're like talking through things and, um, and I said, and then how would you like, would you know that you were loved? How would you know that you were you know, giving back to people. How, I don't know. Like, how would you process your feelings if you were by yourself all the time? I don't know. I just would like be a robot. And then that like led into, you know, a conversation about, and then God would not be mad at me. I mean, we have some deep spiritual conversations in our house, like, <laughs> and then I wouldn't have to always worry about if, if I was doing the right thing or if God was mad at me or if, if these things. And, and so we just kind of, you know, role played like, hello, God, I love you. The, I will obey you. You know, I was like, what, you know, what kind of relationship is that with, with, with God? And, um, so just kind of having to undo some of those legalistic minds that yep. I, I have tried so hard to not teach in my home, but I think as humans, yep. it's just our, that's a natural connection that we have and wanting that's to good. perfect who we are in order to get, to feel like we deserve something good in return. That is absolutely right. Right. Yeah. And it is so central to understanding the character of God and the gospel. Um, it, it's one of the, the things that I think parenting is just undoing that mm-hmm. undoing, first of all, what we may teach intentionally or unintentionally, but undoing that natural uh, tendency of our hearts to, to see and feel the fallenness <laughs> and to feel like we need to fix that in order to approach God. Hmm. So clearly there are a lot of implications for, uh, gospel learning and discovery through, through the family. What would you, what would you say in your experience, having founded the foster, the family organization and the ways that you guys are serving other foster families in your community? Um, if, if people are listening to this and they're like, I don't think that I am equipped to step into this type of parenting. I don't think that I don't know that, I don't know that this is right for me. Um, what would, what would you say to listeners who are, who are thinking through that? So I would say two things. First of all, I would say that none of us are equipped and that none of us are special, that you and I have not figured something out that someone else is incapable of figuring out that I have no special ability to regulate myself, to understand and implement trauma parenting. And so there's nothing special about me. Um, And so I just, first of all, would say you may be as equipped as I am. And um, there's nothing naturally that I'm equipped to do that, that someone else might not be. Uh, The other thing I would say is that not everyone should be a foster adoptive parent. Uh, and I think that this may have to do with our own trauma history. Right. It may have to do with our own attachment styles. It may have to do with um, just what we've been called to. <laughs> there might be someone who absolutely has the ability, but is called to to something different. And so I think really embracing that it is not, well, God loves the vulnerable and the fatherless. And so that means that we should adopt all the kids that, you know, from the pulpit, we're going to say everyone here should be adopting and fostering. And it's that because God is the kind of God who comes near to people in their brokenness, 
as his disciples, we should, first of all, really uh, identify with that brokenness and see ourselves first as the broken who he is healing and, and who he came to rescue. But also we should be the kind of followers who are doing that. And so that might look like adoption. It might look like foster care. It might look like befriending the single mom next door. It might look like having an open door policy in your house where the neighborhood kids are coming in and feeling safe. It might look like, you know, babysitting and bringing meals to those who are fostering or adopting. And it, it is not a one size fits all because we are not one size people. God created the body as a beautiful representation of his bride. This is not that there's something wrong or different between a hand and a nose. It's that he is glorified by a hand and a nose in different unique ways in how they work together to bring honor to him. And so it is not like, oh my goodness, look at this, this person who's been fostering for 10 years. And, and these are all the people she's cared for. It's, it's what is my hand supposed to do to love those that God loves to really spend up my life on his mission of bringing his kingdom onto earth as it is in heaven in, you know, his mission, the gospel work of, of bringing healing to what sin has broken. And so I think that we shouldn't limit ourselves by thinking we need a title or a license or something official to join in this work of loving vulnerable kids and families. So there are two things here that would, I think, fundamentally change the way that the church engages in communities and in neighborhoods. The first one is that if we're going to pour out for anybody, we have to be filled up. Like if we cannot, we cannot open our eyes and see vulnerabilities around us if we are depleted and if we are completely strung out. Um, so addressing our own spiritual formation is critical. The yeah. other part of that is understanding that our spiritual formation will continue to deepen when we are, when we are alongsiders, when we are sitting um, mm -hmm. with people and we're opening our eyes to say, this house down the road from me, um, just something feels off. Like the way that, um, the way that the yard hasn't been mowed in a long time is, is there someone there that's taking care of, is there someone who is vulnerable inside is, you know, I see kids outside a lot. I mean, my, my neighbors have asked questions because my kids are always outside, you know, they're like everything. Okay. Over there. Um, and sometimes it's not, <laughs> um, so, you know, are there kids that do we see a connection with families? Um, if, if a mom comes and says, I have to work this shift in a few days and I have no idea how I'm going to get coverage for my kids. Yeah. Can we, can we step in and say, well, I can, I can come over to my house for the afternoon or, you know, those are ways that we can step in and be like we said earlier, not just complicit in the pain, but actually preventing the pain of a child being removed from a home where they are just one decision away from losing everything that they have yeah. because their parents were not supported by the community. Yeah. When church leaders come to me and say, what can we do to impact the foster care community? My first answer is do everything you can to help strengthen families, to keep kids out of the foster care system. We should absolutely have foster care ministries and adoption help and support groups and all this stuff. But sure. what we should be doing is being a people who walk with people and the, the, power of connection and love and belonging that we can offer in our church body, in our homes, through hospitality. This is the most powerful thing we can do to impact the foster care community is just be good neighbors, the kind of neighbors that Jesus calls us to, where we love our neighbors more than ourselves, more than our comfort, more than, uh, dare I say, protecting our kids. You know, the idea of like that bad influence or this, this bad school district or the things that we try to rescue our kids from, those might be the invitations to love our neighbors as ourselves uh, and do what's really best for them and, and walk and, and love them. That is the most powerful way that we can affect the foster care community. Could not agree more. And so for 
for us as we're processing this conversation, you know, maybe that looks like we are taking up real estate in a different part of our town. Maybe that's where we're making an intentional move um, yeah. to be a neighbor uh, to those who feel isolated. Um, at Kindred Exchange, we talk a lot about social support and how, you know, social support and social capital has so much data around being one of the most powerful things to mitigate mental health crises and to move someone from one class to another class. Mm -hmm. um, and and I am I am convinced that maybe the church has put itself in its own bubble too often. Yeah, we we feel like we can only address issues when it's at the end of a tragic story, mm -hmm. rather than preventing them from the beginning just by opening our eyes. Yeah. You know, and let me just come alongside here because I I am like preaching this with passion. I just a couple of weeks ago heard a couple of really concerning stories about this one kid at school. And I started saying things like, we need to cut off ties here. We need to, and then had a conversation with the uncle who is full-time caring for this child and his concerns and some of the story. And then in a moment it hit me, I was doing what I don't believe in doing. <laughs> and so it's not, I understand how hard it is when we love our kids and we are uh, committed to and called to protect them. And when, you know, of course we want to be safe and we want our lives to be filled with happiness and hope. And, and it is very tempting to want to distance ourselves from the brokenness of other people mm -hmm. to want to put space. Uh, and rather than seeing that we were rescued, just this, this othering of, of I will rescue you, but I won't sit with you. I won't walk with you and, and be close. Um, and so I just want to just confess that that coming alongside this struggle for anyone who feels it, because it was just two weeks ago that I caught myself wanting to to separate from someone's brokenness rather than jump in with them. Well, you're holding me accountable as well, because the, I mean, we're, as we talk about kids that are sitting in the classroom with our kids and are teaching them new words or new concepts yeah. or things yeah. that we're like, well, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, there are parents, it, people may have a picture in their mind when we're talking about taking up real estate. Um, they may have a picture in their mind of what part of town I'm talking about, but I will say that um, just as much as I'm talking to my kids in, in public school or, uh, you know, whatever about the things they're learning at school, it is happening just as much, if not more to my kiddo that's in, in private Christian school. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the parents there are, are struggling just as much to know how to parent their kids yeah. and how to, you know, how to be available with them rather than, um, a screen being what, um, what raises them. So yep. Yep. I, that's not to cast a finger. Let's just say we are all struggling. All parents exactly. are struggling everywhere. And, and what does it mean to, to be present? How would, uh, Jamie, how would people find you and what you're doing and how can they, um, how can they recreate, how, how can they get in, involved with foster the family or how can they recreate what you're doing in their own neighborhood? Yeah. So I am on all the social media outlets at foster the family blog, where I'm just sort of sharing the the day-to-day -day joys and struggles of foster care adoption parenting um and foster the family serves holistically in uh five cities and then we have a uh, hundred support groups around the country i we love to walk with foster parents we love to uh, support them as they are opening their homes to kids in foster care and so we're doing that in uh, New Jersey, Baltimore, DC, Grand Rapids, um, and like Tampa Bay, Florida. And I would say, I love that you said, how can they recreate? Because this is nothing like, let me um, promote my organization. It is how do we learn to um, support foster families as they are welcoming kids. And I love the idea of foster parents gathering together for mutual care and support and community. And so anyone who says like, okay, I want to start a foster care ministry. I'm like, just start gathering foster parents together. Those who are uh, joining the journey soon, those who have years experience, we, we have this really unique experience of parenting kids from trauma, navigating the system, dealing with our own grief and loss as we say goodbye to kids, 
Uh, it is incredibly confusing, isolating, unique. And so I think that one of the most healing and important pieces for foster parents, and one of the things that allows them to be great foster parents and, and be a part of a family's healing and have vision to love biological family and help a child heal is, is gathering uh, together with other foster parents who can encourage and help. And so if someone wants to start a foster care ministry, I say, just start with gathering foster parents and, and create a safe space for them to be together. So all that to say, Foster the Family US uh, is the organization I uh, share my life at Foster the Family blog. Um, and I have a book by the same title, Foster the Family. Well, we will make sure that your book and your, your blog and all of your resources are linked in the show notes for anyone. Um, thank you for uh, protecting your, your time and your space in a way that allows you to continue to give um, to others and to give to us. I know that that involved a lot of self a lot of self-discipline and, uh, and, and protecting spaces. So, um, I'm really grateful for your time today. Grateful that we could have this conversation. I needed, I needed to talk one-to-one -one with a mom today that was in the trenches of trying to undo what I thought I was going to be as a, as a parent right. and, and get to know myself better. So I'm really grateful for your wisdom and grateful for your person. Yeah, it was really a joy. Thanks for just sharing fellowship with me and uh, creating this space. I'm grateful. Thank you so much for listening in, and we are always eager to hear from you as you process these nuanced topics. Shoot me an email at lauren at kindredexchange.co or find me on Instagram at Upwardly Dependent. Of course, I always welcome your honest reviews on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast, or you can engage with us on our Kindred Exchange Instagram at kindred.exchange. Just do me one favor. As we process and grow together, stay rooted in truth that you know is absolute. And that is the fact that we are finite beings and therefore rely on something much bigger than ourselves. That's what the Upwardly Dependent Life is all about.